this all day long. Could we just dial back? Could you tell me um, when you were working in the Far East about mm. this? Was it was it kidnapping? Uh, and who were the kidnapping? No, basically what happened is um, because I came back from Iraq and I was like, right, I need to leave this. I need to get out. You know, five, six years in a war zone. It just wasn't, you know, six weeks on, six weeks off. It just wasn't wasn't good for us, for me personally. Um, so I left that and, you know, I was living in Australia by that time. Um, and um, I thought, right, again, just like when I left the military, I was like, right, I'm, I'm creating my own path. I'm doing something totally different, reinventing the wheel. Um, and I got into property, selling property and all this that, and the other. And I thought, right, this is me. I'm not going to go back to a war zone. And then very quickly, again, you know, I got bored. I got really bored. And, and then I started hitting the drink to fill those gaps of boredom. Um, and then I heard something about, um, I, this is quite bizarre. What happened was quite bizarre. A friend of mine was actually living down the road as well, who was a good friend of mine from the, from the Marine, Marines. He'd, he'd moved to Australia because his wife was a nurse. And he invited to, me to a party one night. And I went to his place. It was a fancy dress party, as it would be because of Marines. We all dressed as women. And, uh, <laughs> and um, got to this party and um, he introduced me to this guy who used to be in the military in the UK, intelligence. And um, I don't know if you know this guy. Do you know a guy called Simon Trezellian by any chance? No, that doesn't ring a bell. Right, okay. Yeah. All right. So basically, I knew I saw this guy and I was like, as soon as I bumped into him, I was like, I know you from somewhere. I don't know where I know you from. But he started talking to me and he was chatting away. And I went, suddenly it went ping. And I realized he was one of the harshers when I was on selection. And he was one of the ink guys that was 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 on the on the on the selection team, but on the the R two I team. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the resistance to interrogation. No, team. I never socialised yeah. with any of them. No, <laughs> no. Well, I didn't by choice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, so I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I know, yeah. And we we yeah talked about dates, and he said, yeah, yeah, I was there. And I, I was like, because you never forget those voices, especially when you hear them again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, he told me about an organization that was working in, uh, in Thailand, in Southeast Asia, set up by an ex, um, ex-commando, Australian commando. And basically, they were sending in operatives undercover to, to identify kids that were working in the um, sex industry, um, you know, in brothels, et cetera, et cetera. And immediately, you know, we, I went to a presentation. They talked about the stats, 1.6 million kids being sold into that industry a year. Now, in my book, in my first book, I actually complain about not getting a hug off my dad as a kid. And these kids are sold by their families. And I couldn't comprehend that. I was like, I, I couldn't get my head around it. I really couldn't. So I wanted to have something. I wanted to help change the destiny of, of these kids' lives. So... You know, initially I said I couldn't, I couldn't go undercover because I couldn't even pretend to be a sex trafficker or, you know, a, a paedophile or whatever. I couldn't even go down that route. Um, so basically I, was, I, I decided to come in. I was training operatives to go into, uh, into Thailand, you know, doing some surveillance stuff and all that kind of thing around Brisbane. And then my relationship over there, um, when it took a downturn, it fell apart. And I thought, you know what? fuck this. And I thought, I'm going to go, I want to, I'm going to go on the ops. So next thing we, um, there was an opportunity to take a TV company into uh, Thailand called Vice. You might've heard of them. Um, so, you know, to, to, to film what we're doing out there. And um, I went out there with, with Simon Trezellian, who was the, the ink guy. And um, basically we went to Pattaya where we were, we were running operations with the anti-human trafficking department. So we're going around the brothels, all hidden cameras and everything. We identify the kids that are in these brothels. And, um, and then we'd come out, get the surveillance, and we'd put up a target pack on the wall, you know, all the different, uh, you know, all the, all the targets that we'd seen in these brothels. And I can remember working with them. We'd give a brief, and then we were going to go and do a, a, an operation, a bust. Um, and I can remember looking, and we'd done the brief, and then I turned away, and, as I'm, and then I turned back again. I could see, like... They were they were like that with their phones taking pictures of all the all the in all the targets and I, I just looked and I went this is ridiculous this is really, they're just you know so I knew what was going to happen we then rolled in to do the to do the bust and the whole place all the staff had changed everything it was just you know no, no problem here yeah. uh, and at that point I realised that you know with everything it's always the same you know if you want to resolve the problem you've got to go to the source. So I left the TV crew at that point. I heard about an organization called COSA, Children of Southeast Asia, 
that were running operations across the, the Thai Burmese border. Um, so I went to see a guy called Mickey Chusia who had been, been doing these operations for a long time. Uh, and then basically I took a, a, there was a two man team, there was a four man team, including Mickey. And we got into a, into a pickup truck and then we headed to North Thailand into the jungles. Um, to start to find these camps, these satellite camps all across the border where they hold the kids, you know, all coming across the border and everything, sold by the families. And that's where the cartels come up and they actually get the kids and then recruit them into the brothels, to the fishing villages, into the slave labor camp, you know, all over. So, um, and then we, we went in, we, we traded intelligence for medical supplies uh, and we managed to hit a number of villages and basically get in either before or after the cartels had visited process the kids and then we would have a couple of day turnaround before we could get the kids off and then we would take them to the orphanage and we had outside donations coming in problem being with that is we was they, we had such a good run that um, the organization I worked for the gray man um they decided to put it uh, go to the media uh, and, and say yeah while we were in country we had no idea so while we we're in country and well, um yeah go on mate so go on. i'm guessing these car well the being a cartel they're fucking armed dangerous and make you disappear yeah. no 100 percent. and that was the, that was the, one of the hardest decisions i've ever had to make was us taking weapons on that and you know because if we caught on those routes because all those routes as well are used for for the drug trafficking and everything and if we were caught with weapons then they'd think that we were a dea you know, and that would cause issues. So we decided on that not to take weapons. So we didn't have weapons. We, you know, we had no weapons at all, apart from a knife, I had a knife. Um, and, you know, there was, car the, the cartels were everywhere. It was, it was pretty hideous. So anyway, they, they put it in the papers and then basically this was in the papers all over the world. I think you can still Google it and it still comes up. Um, and the next thing that happened, all this was happening while we were conducting further operations. Um, and the next thing we knew, it was like, right, get out of Thailand. You've got to, you've got to go. You know, there, there's a manhunt for you, basically. And um, what happened, the US State Department had got onto the Thai government. They'd seen it in the papers and said, we give you millions a year to stop this from happening. Nothing happens. Who's this four-man team has done more than you've ever done? So anyway, the Thai government went on the backlash and they were like, there's no such organization. There's no such uh, problem going on. This organization is they're, they're a bogus charity and they're putting the money in their own pockets. So then it was a manhunt for us and we had to escape out of Thailand, drop everything. And uh, we got out by the skin of our teeth uh, across the Burmese border and then back to Thailand, um, which was a real shame for me. But the thing is, one thing... Because I came back, I thought, I put all my money into that. You know, I wasn't being paid. All my money from Iraq went into that. And um, I thought that was, for, for the first time in my life, Chris, you know, forget military, forget the special forces. It was the first time I went, wow, this is brilliant. I was so humbled to be a part of it. Seeing these kids going from slave camps to an orphanage, having a school uniform and walking down the road with a school, you know, with the school bags. That image was just, I was like, this is amazing. I thought that was my life then. I thought that was it. You know, I fi finally found my purpose and that, that fell apart overnight. So I got back to Australia and I was in a mess, an absolute mess. But one thing I did take from that and one thing that has really laid the blue blueprint for everything I do now is I, I, I took one thing from that and you can't buy that, you can't borrow it. And that is the fact, the gift of helping other people less fortunate is overwhelming, overwhelming. Yeah. And that was the one thing, forget the money, forget the fact I was for, that is the one thing I took from that. And that was the backbone and, 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 and the DNA of everything I do now. And I guess this situation is still going on as well, Ollie. Yeah, it is, mate. But and, and because it ended abruptly, I'm now I've re-engaged that. So I, I, it's hard to try and find time to do it. But I'm, I'm I'm now back into that sort of I'm I'm, I'm trying I'm, I'm I want to I want to get I want to do some documentaries on it. I want to actually do some operational work with it. We've I've started meeting people just over the last few weeks actually, and I've I've set the uh, the Grey Man Rescue, which is a thing uh, is a new Instagram account, which is hopefully going to grow not it's not hopefully it's going to grow and i want to get back onto operations to actually stop this from happening because we all think it's happening overseas it's not it's on our doorstep you know the whole um, you know a lot of, you know there's obviously this big uproar all over the world at the moment about blm and 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 you know i do agree with, with the fact you know that the way people were treated a long time ago but this stuff is happening today there's 40 million people on this planet currently today enslaved and and I think um, two, two million of those are children. 
You know, so why are we not doing, putting the effort into what's going on right now? Because we can't change the past. Life or death with Chris Ryan.